Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath, and uh, it's nice to be back to um, to the studies. And we're going to continue looking at M. L. Andreasen's uh, letters to the churches, as you can see there on the screen. And uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the way that you work in our lives and um, for the things that you have taught us, the things that we have experienced, the good things and the difficult things in life. And we know, Lord, that uh, the Sabbath is a blessing after a difficult week. We know, Lord, that uh, we, we have seen your blessings in your hand in our lives, as always. And uh, we know, Lord, that you are working upon us to transform us and change us into your image. Uh, we pray for those that we have contact with, friends, people, my students, and whoever whoever we, we see each day. We pray for them, Lord, that you can give us words to speak, wisdom. And uh, we pray, Lord, that this study here this evening, as we bring in the Sabbath, will be a blessing to each person. We pray for those online who watch these videos. We pray that you can lead us all to understand you, to know Christ as a personal Savior. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so when we were um, going through this before, just to kind of give a bit of background and a reminder, so M. L. Andreasen wrote this in 1957. This was uh, dealing with the evangelical conferences, which uh, I first heard about, you know, it was like a month after I became a Seventh-day Adventist, because the first book I read was Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. He was one of the persons who was at the evangelical conferences and was actually initiated uh, by him contacting Seventh-day Adventists to get uh, get it from the horse's mouth about what this uh, cult believed. And of course, they were kind of surprised at the reaction of the Adventist leadership, that they seemed to be willing to set aside many of their beliefs uh, to be accepted by the evangelicals and not be considered a cult. Of course, this was hidden from the church, and M. L. Andreasen found out about this, um, and he then shared in these letters to the churches, telling Seventh-day Adventists about what had happened. So there are, you know, when you look at the book Questions and Doctrine, it doesn't necessarily say a lot of bad things. It's more what it doesn't say. And there are some headings and some things taken out of context that have set a uh, set in motion back then ideas that, the fruit of it uh, would be seen in the life of people like Desmond Ford. Now, there was, of course, a conservative backlash to uh, Desmond Ford and questions on doctrine. And we know in uh, August of 1980 at the Glacier View, Desmond Ford was, had his credentials taken away on August 15th. They voted to take away his credentials, which is kind of an interesting date. It's also during that time, August 11th, 1980, that I was converted. That was interesting. Um, we'll be later. Yeah. I'll interject here. Uh, something okay. also to something also to note is some people think that he was disfellowshipped, but he wasn't. No, no, no. Because because disfellowship is at the local church level, mm -hmm. some people just don't understand that point. So it's it's an interesting point of order is that he was not disfellowship because his local church refused to do that. So that that's kind of interesting. He got he lost his credentials. He got in a lot of trouble, but he was never disfellowship. No, and he remained a Seventh Day Adventist, at least on the books, until he died. So yeah. So he wasn't, he, yeah, he wasn't disfellowshipped, but just obviously his ministerial credentials were removed. Is this now, what's happening with this Conrad Vine at the moment, uh, Theodore? Yeah, well, I don't know much about, I don't know who Conrad Vine is. All I know is that he he made some statements. He's some, 
high level Adventist minister, Dr. Conrad Vine. And, and he made some statement regarding uh, that we might need parallel conferences because of the division that exists within Adventism over some issues. So I, I guess there's some threat of him getting his credentials removed. I don't know. I, I personally don't really care about this kind of stuff. You know, what's happening in the church today. I, I think in some ways it's it's kind of irrelevant, but you know, I'm not really particularly a fan of, of like dealing with, with those types of issues. Like when we're dealing with something that happened historically, we're not even really addressing the individuals here, right? We're not addressing, you know, who was, you know, the ones that met with the evangelicals and their history and so forth. But uh, yeah, I guess, so that's the idea is Conrad Vine, they're talking about removing his credentials or something, right? Is that the idea? I think it's because of the, uh, in, the, the, the church uh, taking away conscience of the um, COVID yeah. shot. Yeah. yeah, it was over freedom of conscience freedom that of conscience. he felt that, uh, you know. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't watch the video. I just heard about it from other people. But, you know, I don't know who he is. So it doesn't really mean anything to me personally, right? So, yeah, so what's that link for, Kelly? Some YouTube video? Uh, it's it's just a short clip of what he said. Oh, okay. And then yeah. the oh, I'm going to post also a link to a reply by Walter Weiss. It's basically, he was suggesting par parallel or whatever churches. Parallel conference. know, conferences. Yeah. Due to, uh, I don't know, not speaking the full truth is the way he's saying it. He's actually pretty spot on on a lot of things um, yeah and then the thing the issue the main issue the church wouldn't have even worried about it but then he mentioned ties no oh, yeah so you know yeah yeah they're the always really sensitive about tithe right yeah um, i know this is a little bit off topic but remember when there was uh the issue well they published a book called issues dealing with hope international and hartford uh, our Heartland Institute that were that were taking tithe money, and and the funny thing is, you know, they the, the liberals generally don't pay tithe, and conservatives do, you know. So if you chase all the conservatives out, you're going to have a church where you're not going to get much tithe money. So I always thought the whole issue of tithe is kind of uh, uh, misrepresented by the church, and many Adventists have a false idea about tithe. But I did I did my personal studies on it a long time ago, so I have my opinions about it. But this isn't a study on tithe. Um, but anyway, here when we're dealing with this, you know, we have this background of what's happened in the past, and we can see the fruit of it in the present. And the real question is, what do we do? Right? We know that uh, you know we're not going to go back and fix the past, right? And these are things we don't have control over what other people do, but we do need to understand what the issues are. And, and to understand them for ourselves and to experience Christ for ourselves. And we also need to recognize that, that uh, so much of the language of the gospel has been distorted by the church, that many people mean different things by the same words. And, and that's really something that I think is important. You know, one of the things I believe about, uh, communication is well it says in the bible let your yea be yea and your nay nay that is we need to communicate in a straightforward manner that means we don't hide you know what we what our intent is we don't try to manipulate people with our words and and that's what the church was doing in the 1950s one is they were trying to manipulate the evangelicals uh by adopting a language but not necessarily wanting to adopt the ideas that those langu that language implied. In a sense, they were lying to the evangelicals. But the problem is that in doing so, in adopting their language, you do end up adopting their ideas because other people who use language, you open up the door for ideas to come in that uh, you didn't necessarily intend. So... So that's why I think it's important to go through this material here. 
But we're going to start reading. It says, so this is uh, chapter four, of course. Uh, In the documents and letters I've sent out from time to time concerning what I consider a serious departure from the faith on the part of the leaders, I've adhered strictly to the advice which Christ gives in Matthew 18, verse 15 to 17. There he says that if a difference arise among brethren, tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he will not hear, take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto this ch- to the church. This principle I have followed, as will appear from the record. Now, of course, we're, we're familiar with this. This is, and I, I've seen people ignore this with an excuse that if something is done publicly, that you don't need to deal with the person in private. <laughs> right? No, it's uh, all things in order. Yeah. So private first. Well, yeah. But so if somebody says something like the the way that it's been used in the movement here is, you know, I said something, it was public. So nobody has to go to me individually to find out what I actually think about something. Was it they, they can take what I said, take it out of context, twist it around, repeat it, add to it. And other people who hear, who maybe they weren't there, they don't, they they hear it, uh, the gossip and rumors, uh, they they take it as fact. They don't come to me, and and ask me what I said or what I intended to say. I mean, people will even say, um, "Well, you said these words, and words only have one meaning." I've had that thrown at me a few times. Is it true that words only have one meaning? No, look in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have lots of different meanings and connotations. And uh, and people can can twist words and take them from their original intent or context. So it's, it's an important principle to follow. Uh, and I've many times gone to an individual that uh, I heard things that I didn't intend to hear. Like I'd hear something and I'd go talk to them and I'd say, you know, Here's what I heard. I didn't want to hear it, but people told me this, and and I think it's quite serious. And can you give me your side of what what happened? Sometimes I just ignore it. Depends on what it is and what the context is and what my relationship is with that person, right? But definitely, if, if I hear something about somebody, I'm not going to use it against them, unless and and tell it to other people, especially unless I've actually talked to that person myself and know where he stands. Right. So just because we hear things about people doesn't mean they're they're true. So I, I feel it's a good idea not to really bring people into into the situation when we're dealing with doctrine. Right. We, we deal with with what the Bible says. And if we have to deal with the person on an individual level in some way, we have some relationship to them. Then, you know, we talk to them individually. We don't tell everybody about them. And so. ML Andreas, and he says he's followed this principle. And I think it's a very important principle. So he goes on, in the month of May 1957, it was placed in my hand, providentially, I believe, a copy of the minutes of the White Board of Trustees for May 1st and 2nd, 1957, recording a meeting of two brethren with the trustees concerning a statement they had found in Mrs. White's writings regarding the atonement. They sought counsel in this matter, inasmuch as what they had found did not harmonize with the new view which the leaders were advocating. What attitude should these researchers take in view of Mrs. White's statement? For a number of months, even for years, our leaders have been studying with some evangelical ministers with a view to eventual recognition of the Adventists as an evangelical Christian body. Now, but I mean, one thing is, why would that matter? Why, why would we care whether the evangelical churches considered us any part of the evangelical Christian body? W- would that matter to any of you? What other people think about Seventh-day Adventists? No. No, not really. But we are ev- evangelical. We're just not that. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't think. Well, we're definitely. 
But we're definitely not evangelical in in the way that the evangelical churches are. We don't believe like that. Right. Right. So now I guess the idea would be, well, we want to be accepted because if people think we're a cult, then we can't have an influence. And if we can be a part of the evangelical community, then we can have an influence. That's that's the idea that people have, that somehow, you know, if you lie to people about what you actually believe, that uh, you can somehow win them over. That's basically the approach that they were using. I have no problem with people referring to Seventh-day Adventism as a cult. In some ways, I actually think for many Adventists, the church is a cult. That is, I think within every church, there is people who approach their belief in a cult-like way. That is, they don't personally study, they don't really know what is truth for themselves, and they just follow their church. And that can be true of, of every church, every denomination. So I, I see, I don't really care about the church. You know, it's what I believe individually that matters. So, you know, so I, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit extreme in that way, but I, I've never really cared what the church believes, what what the you know the fundamental beliefs of the church or whatever. I I believe in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That's where I get my my oh, understanding. Man. From. Same. And um, no, I do believe in fellowshipping with people, and I do believe that you know we need to communicate what we believe in a straightforward way, whether it's Seventh Day Adventist or non Seventh Day Adventist that we're communicating with. But when it, when I belong to a local church. I have a relationship with those people in that local church. I don't really feel that I have a relationship with the Seventh Day Adventist Church as an organization. I, I never joined the church on that basis, and um, I've never had that relationship with the church that I really cared about what the Seventh Day Adventist Church was doing. I didn't care about like how many Seventh Day Adventists there are in the world, or what our institutions were doing, our hospitals, or our schools never matter to me, right? So, because they're not part of my experience. They don't mean anything to me personally. You know, maybe if my kids, you know, had, you know, gone to an Adventist school or something, I might care about that particular school. But I don't know. It's just I'm, I'm a very much of a localist, right? So the people that I know, that I have relationships with, those are the people that, that I see, that I care about, you know, people that I communicate with in other ways. I may not know them personally, but I still, you know, somebody I don't have never met, I can't really have an opinion about them. You, you know, even if they're some kind of public figure, I don't know who, I, I don't know them. Lots of times people will have opinions about me and they have no knowledge of me other than, you know, the things I do on the internet, which isn't going to really give you a very good understanding of who I am as a person. Right, unless you take a lot of time. I mean, if you spend a lot of time with me on the internet, you might get to know me to some degree. But, you know, you really need to know a person like me and Felix when I went down to Australia. You know, working together, we got to know each other, right, in ways that we could never have known uh, him just watching my my videos or, you know, even just, you know, if we were commenting on social media, you would never get to know a person. So, so I think that's an important uh, point that the church, um, the church has approached religion differently than I personally have, right? And what I think that the church should always look to do is to obey the truth, promote the truth, and allow people to make decisions about whether they believe in Adventism or not, not try to control the church. That's what we have within Adventism. Uh, the studies were concerning the doctrines of Adventists, particularly the atonement, the investigative judgment, and Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary since 1844. These doctrines, the evangelicals had called the most colossal, psychological, face-saving phenomenon in religious history. And so, and had so denominated them in their journal, Eternity, Eternity Magazine, for September 1956, reprinting the article in an extra under the title, Our Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Now, of course, you know, they're, they're kind of sh shooting themselves in the foot 
because what they, these sort of epithets that they throw at uh, Seventh-day Adventists, this sort of pejorative language here um, in mocking Adventism, is the same sort of language that atheists and non-Christians throw at Christians regarding the resurrection, right? It's, the resurrection is just a, a face-saving phenomenon. It's a, it's, it's a deception, right? So we need to we need to always be careful that when we uh, are pointing fingers at others that you know we're not we're, that we need to be aware of what that actually says about what we believe. Can those arguments be used against us? Uh, the evangelical ministers appear to have made a pronounced impression upon the Adventist leaders, so much so that Dr. Barnhouse, one of the participating evangelical ministers, reports that the Adventist leaders totally repudiated some of their most important doctrines. It may be best to let Dr. Barnhouse tell the story himself as he reported it in the extra named above for September 1956. The particular subject which he discusses is what is called the Great Disappointment and has reference to the Great Disappointment of the Adventists in 1844 when they expected the Lord to come. Here is his account. On the morning after the Great Disappointment, two men were going through a cornfield in order to avoid the pitiless gaze of their mocking neighbors to whom they had said an eternal goodbye the day before. Uh, to put it in the words of Hiram Edson, the man in the cornfield who first conceived this peculiar idea, he was overwhelmed with the conviction that instead of our high priest coming out of the most holy of the heavenly sanctuary to come to this earth on the 10th day of the seventh month at the end of the 2300 days, he for the first time entered on that second day, on that day, the second apartment of that sanctuary, and that he had to had a work to perform in the most holy before coming to this earth. It is to my mind, therefore, nothing more than a human face saving idea. It should also be realized that some uninformed Seventh-day Adventists took this idea and carried it to fantastic, literalistic extremes. Mr. Martin and I heard the Adventist leaders say flatly that they repudiated all such extremes. This they have said in no uncertain terms. Further, they do not believe, as some of their earlier teachers taught, that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on Calvary, but instead that he is still carrying on a second ministering work since 1844. This idea is also totally repudiated. They believe that since his ascension, Christ has been ministering the benefits of the atonement, which he completed on Calvary. Uh, since the sanctuary doctrine is based on the Jewish high priest going into the Holy of Holies to complete his atoning work, it can be seen that what remains is most certainly exegetically untenable and theological speculation of a highly imaginative order. What Christ is now doing since 1844, according to this version, is going over the records of all human beings and deciding what rewards are going to be given to individual Christians. We personally do not believe that there is even a suspicion of a verse in Scripture to sustain, to sustain such a peculiar position. And we further believe that any effort to establish it is stale, flat, and unprofitable. Profitable. Okay, so one of the things interesting here is we did go through E.J. Wagner's, what's called his deathbed confession, but his confession of faith, the last thing that was on his desk when he died, so one of the last things he wrote, uh, a letter to a friend, and um, and he repudiates this idea, right, of the investigative judgment. Now, we went through that, and we can see uh, that the types of arguments that are being used really are not scriptural, that you have a great difficulty once you understand the sanctuary and the prophecies connected to it to, to just dismiss uh, this idea of the investigative judgment. Now, of course, you can see here he's sort of misrepresenting it, right? And I think many Adventists have a misrepresented view of the investigative judgment. So I've asked some of these questions before. Um, uh, but who's who's being judged in the investigative judgment? Like here it says, you know, all all people, right? 
going over the records of all human beings and deciding what rewards are going to be given to the individual Christians. Do, do we believe that? Is that what Jesus is doing in the heavenly sanctuary? Who, who particularly is being judged? Well, I don't know. I believe God is before the whole universe and people. Well, I mean, I mean, God's character is part of the issue, but it's it's the righteous, right? Ah, uh, yes. Right. So it's the yeah. righteous first, the righteous dead, and then the righteous living. Now, we, so we as Adventists, uh, Theodore, look at the sanctuary. So we, if we put this together with the sanctuary, if Jesus is the Lamb that was put on the cross then that's the first part of the sanctuary service. And then we have to look at the rest of the sanctuary service. Right. And I, think, so, I think that's where we, we, we probably have a different outlook. And, you know, we have to understand that they can criticize all they want, but by their fruit, we'll know them. And if we can explain it through the sanctuary and ask them how they see the sanctuary, but because most other um, Christian organizations don't have the sanctuary at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, to understanding the sanctuary is the key to understanding this. Now, so we know that it's it's the sins of the righteous that are going to be uh, taken when the sanctuary is cleansed that are going to be confessed upon the head of the scapegoat. So they're going to be cleansed. So some people will even then say, well, they say, well, you're making Satan your savior because he's going to be the one that bears your sins. Right. And of course, those sins have already been forgiven, been forgiven by Christ. And those those sins then are the responsibility for sins are going to be placed upon the head of Satan. In some ways, Christ has taken since sin began, Christ has taken the responsibility of sin upon himself. Right. Because he created us. And he created us with a free will. And because of that, we, we can we could make a choice to sin. And so in some ways, God is responsible for sin existing. Right. But he's not really responsible because of love. God has to allow people to make a choice because the other option would be to restrict our choice so that we could only choose good things, which would make us basically automatons. Right. We wouldn't have a free will. We couldn't really truly love and we couldn't experience uh, love. And. You know, one of the things about love is that love suffers. Now, I, I, I had recently this discussion on Facebook with some atheists. And um, obviously, the, you know, they don't believe in God. Right. And they think that God is cruel. If he does, if he did exist, the type of God that we describe is cruel. Now, of course, I've asked atheists, well, if you were in charge of the universe, if you were God, what kind of universe would you create? Would you create a universe where... People could have the free will to choose to reject you. Of course, they never answer that question because they know where it leads. Now, I shouldn't say they never, because some will say, well, if somebody sinned right away, that person would be killed. Right. So God should punish sin right away. Right. Is that more than more just than God allowing sin to work its way out and for people to see what it is? If God just punished people right away, well, that would be, it would just create more and more rebellion, right? Like if God had just, you know, destroyed Satan and his angels, uh, and even though, you know, they're, they're forever lost, he's, he's allowing them the opportunity to see the results of their own actions. So in the end, when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Satan himself bows and acknowledges the judgment against sin is just. So this issue of the great controversy is not well understood. And that's also tied into this whole issue of the investigative judgment and the day of atonement. And Christians don't generally have an answer for this. Now, of course, most Christians believe that God is going to torture the wicked forever and ever throughout eternity, right, which is, uh, very unjust. And that's what a lot of atheists respond to, you know, but they don't really have an explanation for why we have the world going on. They might be, well, everybody has to hear the gospel, right? 
you know, you, you've all heard that, right? The gospel has to go to the whole world first before the end can come. And, but of course, there's still going to be lots of people who have lived and died who have never heard the gospel. So I, I don't think that that's, that's why, you know, Christ hasn't come back yet. It's, it's sort of reading into the scripture something that's not really being said. Jesus is saying the gospel is going to go to the whole world. And then the end shall come because we're going to have the whole world make a decision for or against God and probation will close. But, but Christians have no concept of that. They just think the gospel has to go, but they have no idea of the great controversy and the part that that has to play in it. We, we have um, to remember that God's, God's way is always the right way. And if, if we think there's something wrong, we have to look at what, what we're looking at because we're probably looking at it wrong. The sanctuary is very important. And if we revolve, if we, if we understand it through the sanctuary, we have a different understanding. Mm-hmm. As I said, I was going to do a Bible study with some people. These are Baptist people and they believe the 144,000 uh, prophets, uh, they have to be on the earth first and they, they're going to, they're going to live for three and a half years. And I said, where do you get that from? And he was going to look it up, but he didn't know. But um, it's something we have to go back to the sanctuary because the sanctuary is very understandable if you study it. But if we just put it off as, you know, that's the old from the old days. Well, you know, I I had this uh, question recently, you know, behold the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. That's why I I put that onto the Facebook um, Catholic Orthodox Protestant group to actually ask people to think. And I suggested they read uh, The Cross and the Shadow by Stephen Haskell. But it's something we have to understand. The sanctuary has a very important part in salvation. Well, and, and, you know, and, also, and understanding prophecy, I mean, the book of Revelation uses all of this sanctuary symbolism, you know, as it, as it goes through the first part of Revelation, you're going to have, you know, the candlesticks, then you're going to have the table of showbread and the and, uh, uh, the altar of incense, and then you're going to have like the brazen altar. That's the offering altar of burnt offering. Are going to be referred to, um, and then of course you're going to have like in chapter four, you're looking into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Later on, you're going to look into the most holy place, and you're going to see the ark of the covenant. Right. So all of this sanctuary symbolism is used in Revelation, and, and generally goes over the head of most Christians. I've I done mean. Bible studies where I've I've gone to Christian Bible studies groups, and they were studying the book of Revelation. And, and uh, of course, they just have a bunch of guesses of what everything means. Um, some things they take literally, like I've seen some of them take the beasts as literal beasts. It's very strange. But uh, but when you start mentioning the sanctuary and, and talking about, the, like, they just have no concept of it. So, so it's something that uh, Adventists know about. But we don't fully understand it. So um, some Adventists will get the idea, well, God is trying to decide who's going to be saved and who's lost. But when he's going over the record of of those, like some of them are dead, right? But Abel, is Abel going to be in heaven? Yes, he was righteous. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, but... The investigative judgment hasn't happened. Is in the investigative judgment, is that's when it's going to be decided? I mean, it's already been decided, right? You've There's got an awkward one here, at Theodore, because Jesus took some with him when he when he died. So yeah, maybe which I was just going to mention. So there are some people who who have actually entered into heaven. So so God actually knows. God doesn't have to figure out Amen. who are his and who are not his, right? So that is, there is a purpose for this, what we call the investigative judgment. And and we use it as the investigative judgment to distinguish it from what we call the executive just judgment. That is, when God is going to bring judgment against sin. So this is, is a work that is dealing with the cleansing of the sanctuary, right? And, and the purpose of it, for us, for the living, is that we examine our own hearts. So the investigative judgment is is a work that God has always done. But we come into a time in history where the symbolism of the judgment now becomes presented. And, and since it's the righteous, it talks about the investigative judgment. First, God deals with the dead, and then he deals with the living. But anybody who's alive during the time of the judgment 
in some ways is involved in that investigative judgment, right? Yeah. Right, because you're alive, you're in the time of the judgment. And so, you know, when we say the judgment passes from the dead to the living, well, what Ellen White's talking about there has to do more with prophetic line, right? So we put the judgment of the living began at 9-11. And we need to understand what that means. And I don't think that we, we generally do. We don't know what it means, the judgment of the dead, the judgment of the living. We, 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 we use those terms, but if you talk to Adventists and you try to get them to find, well, what's actually happening, they, they can't give you an answer, right? So there are some things there that we really need to study into and understand about with the investigative judgment. But we know we're in the time of the judgment, the Day of Atonement. And I got um, to interject. Yeah. Uh, so once or each person, when they finish the program, before they finish, they have to, they ask them to make an aftercare plan sort of thing. What's your plan for after this? Mm -hmm. And then the counsel, counselor, you know, looks at when you're going to finish, asks you if you have your plan ready, and then he assigns you a date to present to the to the home group. So my date is 9-11. <laughs> September 11th. I didn't pick. September 11th. I did not pick it. <laughs> number after number after number being confirmed. Well, yeah, because you started there on July 18th. So Started on July 18th. The church across the street is built in 1844 and presenting yeah. on 9-11. I mean... Mm -hmm. You can't make this up. I couldn't yeah. arrange it. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's pretty neat. And so, so what we what we can say, like if we try to bring this into what we're talking about, is that there is a work that God is doing now that he wasn't doing earlier. And that work has to do with the light that's being presented now. That is, it's not some arbitrary point. That God doesn't just, he couldn't, if the Millerite movement had not occurred, God would not have just arbitrarily began the Day of Atonement, right? Amen. I shall just put something in here to uh, see yeah. you're mentioning about those will be saved, who will not be saved. This is out of um, letter 203, 1905, salvation in the last hours of life. Some among the redeemed will, will have laid hold of Christ in the last hours of life. And in heaven, instruction will be given to those who, when they died, did not understand perfectly the plan of salvation. Christ will lead the redeemed ones beside the river of life and will open to them that which, while on this earth, they could not understand. This is the God we serve, all merciful and loving. And, and, and so the investigative judgment has something to do with those that are going to be resurrected at the second coming, right? The righteous. So there, there obviously has to be a work that's done for them in some way. So it's not deciding necessarily who's going to be there, though that that is in sort of implied as part of it. But there has to be some kind of provision made, a cleansing, that those people can come up in that resurrection and there's some kind of security, right? So that means obviously that's connected to the final generation. Because they without us cannot be made perfect, right? So the final generation has to demonstrate something so that probation can close. And then they have to go through that experience where they demonstrate the work that Christ had accomplished at the cross is actually worked out in that 144,000. And then the wicked can, or the righteous, pardon me, can be resurrected in the first resurrection and the wicked are going to be resurrected after the thousand years. So there's going to be a judgment done for the wicked before they're resurrected as well by the 144,000 during the time of the millennium, right? And so that they can be resurrected. You know, so when we're dealing with this cleansing of the sanctuary, only the righteous are, are only those sins that have gone beforehand to judgment are the ones that can be blotted out, right? So that the righteous can be resurrected. So God already knows 
And he's told us some of those that are righteous that are going to be in the first resurrection. So he doesn't have to figure that out. But that's a common misconception. Just taking some words that Ellen White says, but not everything. So when we deal with this, these criticisms that are made up by people like E.J. Wagner before he died and what we see here at Donald Barnhouse, is that one is they haven't really taken the time to understand the whole issue of of the judgment and what it means. Okay, so um, so M. M. L. Andreessen is going to go on and talk about what uh, Donald Barnhouse has just said. He says, in explanation of this somewhat somewhat involved statement, I append the following explanation, which may clarify some expressions. Uh, Dr. Barnhouse first reports the well-known incident of Hiram Edson going through the cornfield on the morning after the disappointment and becoming convinced that instead of our high priest coming out of the most holy, he for the first time entered on that day the second apartment of that sanctuary and that he had a work to perform in the most holy before coming to this earth. Okay, so the work he was to do before coming to this earth was the completion of the atonement, which involved the investigative judgment. This conception, says Dr. Barnhouse, is nothing more than a human face-saving idea. Then he continues, some uninformed Seventh-day Adventists took this idea and carried it to fantastic, literalistic extremes. That is, they believed that Christ really did go into the Most Holy to do a work which had to be done before his coming to this earth, which involved the investigative judgment and the completion of the atonement. Dr. Barnhouse reports, Mr. Martin and I heard the Adventist leaders say flatly that they repudiate all such extremes. This they have said in no uncertain terms. Okay, so there's a number of things here to comment on. So when do Adventists in general first hear about Hiram Edson's cornfield vision? In what year? Does anybody know? It's like two years after or something. I forget the year. You were 1905. 1905. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) He never wrote down the account until 1868, and it was never published. Loughborough is going to be the one who publishes Higher Medicine's account for the first time. And that's where people are going to hear about it. Did yep. he tell anybody at the time and when it happened? It did- yes. So he told um, Crozier, and Crozier did the study based on that idea. But Crozier never mentions, you know, that the idea came from uh, Hiram Metzen. And, and James and Ellen White were friends of Hiram Metzen. So they, they would have known about it. But it's generally, it just generally was not uh, known uh, by Seventh Day Adventists at the time, right, or, or Adventists in general. So it's just kind of an interesting point. Now, it's interesting well, because E.J. Wagner in um, in the Everlasting Covenant was saying when he had his in, in, um, divine um, vision in in the church that people wouldn't understand unless they've had one similar. And I, I can relate to this because basically I had something similar. And it's one that you don't go around telling everybody because they would think you're crazy if you yes, say told them the, the heavens open in your living room. But it's something that uh, it makes sense when it um, goes together with the word and with especially the sanctuary. Yeah. And see, their 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 belief was not based upon Hiram Edson having a vision. Amen. Their belief was based upon the study of the scriptures. Yes. Right. Which I think is an important point. Now, Dr. Barnhouse, of course, you know, he's painting a picture around this to sort of discredit it, make it look foolish. If we are to believe Dr. Barnhouse's statement, then our leaders repudiated a doctrine which we have held sacred from the beginning. And this is made clear as Dr. Barnhouse continues. Some of their earlier teachers taught that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on Calvary, but instead that he was still carrying on a second ministerial work since 1844. This idea is totally repudiated. Now, of course, we know the importance of that has to do with our understanding of salvation. So for evangelicals, that all they care about is justification, right? So Jesus died on the cross. Our sins are forgiven. If you say the sinner's prayer and, you know, you, you, you believe it, it doesn't really matter what you do. 
you're still going to be saved because Christ, you know, he's forgiven your sins and covered them over. And you're just going to continue sinning for the rest of your life. You might have a bit of improved life. You know, living a Christian life is obviously going to be better for you than not living a Christian life. But it's not really going to make any difference about whether you're saved or not. Right. I've heard that uh, sentiment from the pulpit in Calgary Central Church from the uh, lead, lead pastor basically uh, saying that you're going to sin, you're going to confess, you're going to be forgiven, and you will get up tomorrow and repeat it again. Now, of course, I was quite surprised. In some ways, <laughs> I mean, this it is, is the senior pastor. This is the, you know, yeah. In some ways, it is our experience, though, because as sinners, we we should be seeing ourselves as sinners. And there are going to be times we stumble and fall. We kind um, of left it without the hope that there there might be a time yeah. where we will reach, where a generation will reach that. Where we so, so rather there, die than commit a non sin. Okay. Now, there was this guy named Robert Brimsmead and, um, um, back in the 60s. So Robert Brimsmead, who's no longer an Adventist, I think he's dead by now, but uh, he left Adventism over time. Uh, but this one of the things that Satan did to kind of mess things up is they had this idea that Jesus had a sinless nature and that in order for us to not sin, we need to get a sinless nature. Right. And so the, the, holy, this, the, the holy flesh movement. Yeah. Right. So it's part. Yeah. And, and, you know, it shows up in different ways at different times with different language. But some people believe that something magical happens and then we stop sinning. Right. So something has to change. You know, so the close of probation, our nature changes. This is sort of what Robert Brimsmead was teaching, that we get this new sinless nature. And that's why we can and go through the time of Jacob's trouble. But, you know, all these are just distortions. So one is Christ had a sinful human nature, the same nature that Adam had after Adam fell. He has the same nature you and I have. And yet he lived a perfect life of righteousness without ever sinning at all, not even by thought yielding to temptation. Now, you know, people say, well, Christ had an advantage. In, in some ways, yes. But when we're converted, when we're born again of the Holy Spirit, we come into the same relation to God that Christ has, right? Because he was born of the Holy Spirit. And he also saw that his, you know, he was constantly confronted with apparent failure. He says, the works that you see me do, they come from the Father. I'm, of my own self, I can do nothing. Now, of course, he could if he had chosen to, but he chose to use the righteousness of his Father not his own righteousness, right? And we don't even have that temptation because we don't have any righteousness of our own to use, uh, though we can sometimes fool ourselves that we are righteous. So he depended upon his father. He didn't turn the stones into bread. He didn't throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple. And um, and he, uh, you know, he didn't bypass the cross. He, he, he chose the way of the cross because of his love for us. He he knew that he had to suffer for our sins, that there would be no way to receive the kingdoms of the world from Satan if he bowed down to Satan, right? So, you know, he depends upon God's word. He's not going to use presumption, and he's not going to avoid the cross. So these are very important uh, principles that that we need to recognize and that we have to live righteousness by faith. And we look at ourselves and we look at the struggles that we have. And with man, it's impossible. But we have to believe that God can do this work in humanity. He can do it in us. But we, we have to get to the point where we're broken, where there's no trust in self. That like Abraham, he tried to produce the promised seed, you know, by human means. And he failed. And God says, no, you know. It, it's it's a child of promise, the child of of the handmaiden of the servant, right? That gendereth to bondage, Hagar, right? But but we are under the new covenant, which is of a promise. God promises 
that he's going to accomplish something in us that is impossible for us to do. But it was done in Christ based on the same promise and the same faith. If we look at um, the, the conflict series in the life of Christ, and he says, I'm, I'm told, uh, 24 times, follow me. If we look at his relationship with God, and as you had just been saying then, we need to follow his example. And his relationship with the Father, he told us, when you pray, pray our Father. And if we have that relationship with him, he can do it through us. Yeah. Right. So so we know we, we never think that we can become righteous. We just believe that Christ's righteousness can be worked out in our life. Amen. So that we can reflect his character. We believe we have to believe that because until that occurs, Christ we, can't. We, we have to live it, Theodore. Yeah. Which is yeah. believing and, and living is the same thing. That you need this final generation. And just because people say, well, have you ever seen anybody that's perfect? You know, I've never seen anybody perfect. It's impossible. Well, yeah, uh, it is impossible for man. But God says that he's going to do this. And it's not going to be by magic. He's not going to just force people to be righteous. He's not going to change something in their head so that they can't sin. It's going to be a real transformation of character through test and trial. And, and that's why we're going through the experiences that we do. So we, we won't trust in self. Right now, we can say that we do, right? I mean, we may even think that we are, even if we're, because those that are, are righteous are never going to even, you know, indulge the thought that they are sinless, right? So it's, it's not really for us to look at ourselves and see ourselves as righteous. Our responsibility is to look to Christ for righteousness and to see ourselves as sinners. Amen. And well, that's, that's, the secret, that's the secret of it all, though, Theodore, keeping our eyes fixed on Christ. And yeah. by beholding, become changed. I had I sold a roof rack here th this week, and a man came and bought it. It was another electrician, and he um, he was part of a Pentecostal church, and he sent his son, he sent his children to an Adventist church, which is interesting. And I mm -hmm. asked him about speaking in tongues, and he said, "Yeah, I speak in tongues." I said, "Do you understand what you're saying?" And he said, "No." And I said, "Well, that that doesn't seem to make sense to me. When God talks, and when I talk to you, if I start speaking in the language you don't understand, it wouldn't make sense." So how can you talk to God? And this is my sister's the same. She says she talks to God who makes it feel makes her feel good, but she doesn't know what she's saying. Uh, so, you know, it, there's some strange Christians out there. Yeah. Yeah. You And you can work your way into speaking in tongues uh, because it is a psychological trick. But anyway, um, when Dr. Barnhouse says that some of our earlier teachers taught that Jesus' atoning work was not completed on Calvary, he must have gotten his information from some of the uninformed authors of our new theology. For history records that all our teachers taught this. James White, J.H. Wagner, Uri Smith, Jane Andrews, Jane Lofgirl, C.H. Watson, E.E. E. Andrews, etc. A bunch of names he lists here. All stoutly defended the doctrine of Christ's atoning work since 1844 and committed their convictions to writing. As I write this, I have nearly all of their books before me. James White, who was three times the General Conference president uh, when he was elected for the first editor of Signs of the Times, wrote in the first issue that of that paper an article to correct false statements circulated against us. There are many who call themselves Adventists who hold views with which we can have no sympathy, some of which we think are subversive of the plainest and most important principles set forth in the word of God. Uh, the second of the 25 articles of faith reads in part as follows. Christ lived our example, died our sacrifice, was raised for our justification, ascended on high to be our only mediator in the sanctuary in heaven, where with his own blood, he makes atonement for our sins, which atonement so far from being made on the cross, which was but the offering of the sacrifices, is the very last portion of his work as priest. And so we understand from the sanctuary, or leaders did in the past, that the offering of the sacrifice is not the completion of the atonement, that the atonement is done by the priest in the sanctuary with the blood Amen. and the various different offerings. So you can never say that the atonement was completed at the cross. You can say the sacrifice for the atonement 
was completed at the cross. Christ doesn't have to continue dying again and again, right? So, so that sacrifice is complete. But you can't say the atonement was completed, right? That's the work done by the priest, not by the sacrifice. Amen. Yeah. These fundamental beliefs were also printed in a little tract and circulated by the thousands. It would be interesting if one who wrote pages 29, 30, 31, and 32 in Questions on Doctrine would furnish us with a list of writers who held views contrary to those of the authors mentioned above. I've not found any proof for the incorrect statements found on those particular pages. To continue our study of Dr. Barnhouse's report in the Eternity Extra, he has just affirmed that the Adventist leaders have totally repudiated the idea that Christ is still carrying on a second ministering work since 1844, by which he means an atoning work instead of this, or by which he means an atoning works instead of this he says they believe that since his ascension christ has been ministering the benefits of the atonement which he completed on calvary this view however does not cons it, that he does not consider consistent the old testament informs us that the high priest killed the sacrifice in the court outside the tabernacle but the killing was not the atonement it is the blood that maketh atonement leviticus 17 verse 11 17 by 17 times 11 is 187 by the way Therefore, the high priest shall bring his blood within the veil and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place. And I mention that because the 187th day of the year is the day of atonement, right? So it's interesting that it's mentioned here in Leviticus 17:11. Anyway, Leviticus 16, first 15 and 16 has been quoted here as well, so that he sprinkles the blood of upon the mercy seat and he shall make atonement for the holy place he goeth in to make atonement verse 17 dr barnhouse argues that as we base our doctrine of atonement largely on the figure given us in leviticus and use that in our teaching on the atonement we must believe that as the high priest on earth took the blood into the sanctuary and there made an atonement so christ must do likewise he must go in to complete the atonement. Else we have an atonement without blood. And if we do not take the last step, then we are compelled to believe that the atonement was made in the court and not the sanctuary, which completely destroys all typology. If this last service with the blood is omitted, then our theory of the atonement is sadly incomplete and is most certainly exegetically untenable and theological speculation of a highly imaginative order. If Christ does not go in with the blood to complete the atonement, then what we have left is stale, flat, and unprofitable. He has a good argument. Okay, so he turns his words back upon him. Now, uh, so this next, that, that question, is it true? That's, that's always a really good question to ask anytime you're confronted with something, is, is it true? and to try to dig into whether something's true or not. But anyway, let me go on here. When I first read in the extra that our leaders had repudiated the doctrine of Christ's atoning work in the sanctuary since 1844, and had substituted for this the application of the benefits of the sacrificial atonement he made on the cross, I could not believe it, and did not believe it. When I was told that even if I read in the writings of Ellen G. White that Christ is making atonement now, I am not to believe it. I wondered, what are we coming to? The atonement was made 1,800 years ago, our leaders say. Sister White says the atonement is going on now. Questions on Doctrine says it was made 1,800 years ago. The ministry says the atonement on the cross was final. Who or what am I to believe? To me... To repudiate Christ's ministry in the second apartment now is to repudiate Adventism. That is one of the foundation pillars of Adventism. And if we reject the atonement in the sanctuary now, we may as well repudiate all Adventism. For this, God's people are not ready. They will not follow the leaders in apostasy. Amen. Of course, they sort of did, but um, he was hoping they wouldn't. Anyway, at this juncture, it occurred to me that perhaps the eternity men had regretted 
what they had written and had retracted or would retract all they had written. So I wrote to Eternity asking if they still published the extra. They answered that they did, the article being copyrighted. I then asked for permission to quote them. I received the answer. We are glad to give you permission to quote from the article, our Seventh-day Adventist Christians. I would appreciate you give, giving credit to Eternity when you do this. This letter was dated Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania May 2nd, 1958, and signed by the editor. This was 20 months after the article had first appeared in Eternity. If at any time during those 20 months, our leaders had protested, if they had made a demur in honesty, the editor, were, editor would have warned me not to use the material and not to quote these statements. But the editor did no such thing. He was glad and willing for me to use the material, willing to stand by what the extra had published, willing for me to quote them. It is fully five years since the discussions began and three years since the extra was published. For this long time, I've been waiting for our men to deny the charges and rebuke the evangelicals for publishing such defamation of our entire leadership. But I've heard no protest. On the contrary, I've read several references in our papers to these evangel evangelicals as being fine Christian gentlemen, which I believe is true. Such men do not tell falsehoods. In the absence of any denial or protest from our men, I have reluctantly drawn my own conclusions. But if our men will make a straightforward declaration that Dr. Barnhouse and Mr. Martin never heard them make such statements as eternity, I don't know, averse, is that a word? Right. I will immediately get in contact with the evangelicals and ask yeah. them to make yes. apologies. To be aver averse. Averse, uh, yeah, anyway, okay. To ask them to make apologies for such serious and grave accusations. This matter is too serious to go by default. Thousands of our people have read the Eternity article and are seriously concerned. One of the main pillars of our faith has, according to Eternity, been removed. Shall we stand idly by and permit the sanctuary to be trodden underfoot? And that by its supposed supporters? Okay, we shall now return to the two men who entered the White Vault on, in May 1957 to counsel with the White Trustees. They had finished their research work and reported to the board that they had found indications, Sister White taught, that the atoning work of Christ is now, that is in 188, is now 1880 at the time she wrote that, in progress in the Heavenly Sanctuary. This discovery was a death blow to their new theology. It was evidently impossible to believe that the work of atonement was completed on the cross and was final, and also to teach that it was still in progress in heaven. Those statements could not be true. However, the denomination had already committed itself on this point and had in 1957 published in the ministry that the great act on the cross was a complete, perfect, and final atonement for man's sin. It's ministry, February 1957. Yeah, so yeah, I just think it was a type of dog. Okay. Um, the article said that this is now the Adventist understanding of the atonement, confirmed and illuminated and clarified by the spirit of prophecy. Getting from that ministry magazine. This statement has never been retracted or modified or changed, and neither the writer nor editor has been reproved. It stands. In view of the situation, what were the researchers to do? They were faced with the statement of Mrs. White's that the atonement is now in progress in heaven. And they were face to face with other state, uh, the other statement of the leaders that the atonement was made and finished on the cross. They must accept one or the other. They chose to go with the leaders. But what about Sister White's statement? statements? For there are many of them. It was clear that in some way her influence must be weakened and her statements watered down. But that was a delicate piece of work, and whatever was to be done had to be done in secret. If it were found out in time, the plan would not succeed. If, however, they could work in secret and work rapidly, that matter would be fait accompli, and done before anyone found out about it. It was at this time that a copy of the White Minutes were handed me, I shall now present the minutes so that all may see for themselves what was done. 
So the minutes of May 1st, 1957, page 1483. At this juncture in our work, elders X and Y were invited to join the trustees in discussing further a matter that had been given study in January. Elder X and his group who have been studying with certain ministers have become acutely aware of E.G. White's statements, which indicate that the atoning work of Christ is now in progress in the heavenly sanctuary. In one statement in Fundamentals of Christian Education, the word sacrifice is used to non-Adventists, unfamiliar with our understanding of the sanctuary question, references to the continuation of the atoning work of Christ are difficult to grasp, and it was suggested to the trustees that some footnotes or appendix notes might appear in certain of the E.G. White books, clarifying very largely in the words of Ellen White, our understanding of the various phases of the atoning work of Christ. It was felt by the brethren who joined the trustees in the discussion that this is a matter which will come prominently to the front in the near future and that we would do well to move forward with the preparation and inclusion of such notes in future printings of the LNG White books. Uh, the matter was discussed carefully and earnestly, but at the time that the meeting broke up to accommodate other committees, no action was taken, right? So we, we actually had read some of this before. Um, the meeting of the trustees held May 1st closed with no action taken on the question, which was discussed at length. Suitable footnotes or explanations regarding the E.G. White statements on the atoning work of Christ, which indicate a continuing work at the present time in heaven. Inasmuch as the chairman of our board will be taken, will be away from Washington for the next four months, and the involvements in this question are such that it must have the most careful consideration in council, it was voted that we defer consideration until a later time of the matters that were brought to our attention by elders X and Y involving the E.G. White statements concerning the continuing and learning work of Christ. Okay, so um, you can see that they they just think that they can fix it with some uh, footnotes. So um, M.L. Andreessen goes on, after the chairman of the board had returned from his four month trip, the matter was further discussed and it was decided not to grant the request. So they didn't do it. Uh, this action is worthy of commendation, but the praise is somewhat dimmed by the fact that it took eight months to come to this decision and that they did not arrive at this conclusion until the plan had become known. And this report stunned me. How did anyone dare to suggest inclusions in Sister White's writings to bolster the new view? I pondered long and prayed much. Did I have any responsibility in this matter? If I did, it would be my duty to speak to one man and one man and one only, as the transgression was not against me, but against the church and our most holy faith. It was my, it was my duty to speak to our highest officer. This I did. In my letter of February 26, 1957, I had voiced my fear of publishing the proposed book, Questions on Doctrine, as it had been prepared altogether too hurriedly and after only a short time of study. Books of this kind cannot be written on short notice and should be prepared by men who have given a lifetime of study to the subject and spent years in research of the testimonies. Uh, March 7th, 1957, I received this answer. I notice your observation. I fear greatly for the contents of the book that is being published, setting forth our belief. I do not believe, Brother Andreas, in that you need to fear for what will appear in the book. It is being carefully gone over by a group of capable men in whom we have the utmost confidence. I feel quite confident you'll be happy with the results. In my answer of March 11th, I again expressed my fear of the contents of the book, referring to an article that appeared in the ministry February 1957. I said, if the committee agrees with this, with his published views, I must most earnestly protest, for the views are most certainly not Adventist doctrine, but views derived from a superficial study of certain portions of the writings of Sister White and do not represent the general teachings. I finished with these words. I hereby lodge my protest against the publication at this time of any doctrine of the atonement, and I wish my protest to be duly recorded. I can but feel that some of the brethren have been led into the present predicament by a desire to be like the nations around us, churches, and that we will yet rue the day when we began making concessions because of pressure from outside sources. 
Receiving no answer, I wrote again on May 10th, 1957. I trust that you get the idea that I am in earnest. I have the utmost confidence in you. In my more than 60 years of official connection with the denomination, one of my chief aims has been to inspire confidence in the spirit of prophecy. The last two years, I have spoken on the subject 204 times. I felt that our people need help, needed help, and I've tried to help them. I'm heartbroken of what the future seems to hold unless God helps us. May the Lord give you both wisdom and courage to do what the situation demands. After I had come into possession of the confidential minutes of the White Estate Board, I followed Christ's instruction to speak to him alone and sent four letters to our chief officer, June 26, 1957. I received this answer. I'm certain we can trust the brethren of the White Estate to move cautiously in this direction and not to take positions that might be embarrassing in the future. Certainly, Brother Andreasen, there is no intention here whatever to tamper with the writings of Sister White. We value them most highly. Referring to the book on questions on doctrine, or on book on questions and answers, let me assure you here too that this is not the work of the brethren whose names you mention. It is true that they did certain original work, but it was taken out of their hands and is the product of a large group of men rather than a few. July 4th, 1957, I answered, here's part of this answer. I fear the day may come when this matter will become known to the people, and it will shake the faith of the whole denomination. Of course, some will rejoice that at last Sister White has been disposed of, disposed of. Others will weep and cry to the Lord for consolation. Spare thy people and give not thine heritage to reproach. And when we are caught in our own net, will the churches of the world gloat? Please, brother, see to it that the proposed book is not published. It will be fatal. If there is no atoning work now going on in the sanctuary above, then the denomination may as well admit their mistake openly and fairly and abide by the consequences. Let us throw Sister White aside and no longer hypocritically defend her writings. But behind, the, behind these scenes, edit them and still claim that they are her work. I, I close with an expression of high regard for you facing the great apostasy, the greatest apostasy the church has ever faced. December, December, September 18th, 1950, 1957, I received this communication. I have considered the matter to which you referred closed. I do not believe you have the right to use the board minutes of the white estate as you have done. The minutes are confidential and not intended for public use. I hope the time will never come when we take the position that men are to be condemned and disciplined because they come before properly constituted church boards to discuss questions that may have they may have pertaining to the work and belief of the church. September 27th, 1957, I answered, I thank you for your letter of September 18, wherein you state that the matter to which you refer is closed. I called for an investigation, this you denied. You have condoned the men involved, and you have also said that I had no right to use the information which has come to me, and then you closed the door. May I explain that the only way I have used my information is to inform you and no one else. What else could I do? You state that if such information had come to you, you would not have used it. Quite an admission to consider the present instance the greatest apostasy that has ever occurred in this denomination, and this you would have kept undercover, and now you have closed the door. I do not believe, Brother Figure, that you have considered the seriousness of the situation. Our people will not stand for any tampering with or attempt to tamper with the testimonies. It will give them an uneasy feeling that all is not well at headquarters. Read again my letter of September 12. You can save the situation, but only as you are willing to open up the matter. You are about to ruin the denomination. I am praying for you. My correspondence with Washington proceeded along this line until on December 16, 1957, I received this ultimatum. They, the officers, therefore request that you cease your activities. Three days later, I received this additional word. This will place you in plain opposition to your church and will undoubtedly bring up the matter of your relationship to the church. In view of all this, the officers, as I have previously written, earnestly ask you to cease your activities. Up till this time, there had been no suggestion of a hearing. I was simply ordered to cease my activity and the implied threat that if I did not do so, 
it will undoubtedly bring up the matter of your relationship to the church. There's no suggestion of a hearing. I was simply ordered to stop my activity. I would be condemned without recourse. The threat that my name would come up for consideration could mean anything. There's no question raised as to the justice of my complaint. I was condemned already. The only question was what punishment, the punishment, my punishment would be. This brought to mind what had been published in the Eternity Extra, that our men had explained to Mr. Martin that they, the Adventists, had among them certain members of their lunatic fringe, even as there are similar wild-eyed irresponsibilities in every field of fundamental Christianity. In contrast to this lunatic fringe, they had a sane leadership, meaning themselves. I do not know how our leaders conducted themselves while with the evangelicals, but they left the impression upon these men that the majority group of sane leadership, which is determined to put the brakes on any members who seek to hold views divergent from that of the responsible leadership of the denomination. Let the reader ponder this. We have a sane leadership, according to their own estimation, and we also have a lunatic fringe of wild-eyed irresponsibles. This sane leadership is determined to put the brakes on any members who seek to hold views divergent from that of the responsible leadership of the denomination. I could not believe this when I first read it. Here I was, for 50 years, an honored member of the church, having held responsible positions, but if I dared hold views divergent from that of the responsible leadership of the denomination, I became a member of the wild-eyed irresponsibles who constituted the lunatic fringe of the denomination. And without a hearing, I was ordered to cease my activity or feel the brakes applied. And if I did not now have the documents before me, I would have difficulty in believing that any sane leadership would attempt to stifle criticism and make threats against any members who seek to hold views divergent from that of the responsible leadership of the church. Had it come to this? Rome, but a little further. Rome went, but little further. So I'm just seeing how much is left here. That's quite a bit. A any comments on this so far? It sounds similar to what's happening with this Conrad Vine at the moment. He's questioning and they're pushing him off to the side. So it's uh, maybe quite oh. relevant at this time. Well, and it's, you know, it's, it's happened with the 2520, uh, you know, Kelly Ross was disfellowshipped, you know. I mean, he had somewhat of a hearing, not really a very fair one, because they already had decided. It was more just a try to uh, badger him into uh, recanting, I think, is mostly yeah, what it was. Pretty much. I was also told before before the business meeting that it would not be involving the 2520. It wasn't be, to be the subject, and it was the first thing they talked about. I was pretty much blindsided. No, yeah. no opportunity to prepare. Really. Yeah, and 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 we see, of course, we saw this happening within this movement as well. That we we understand that if you want to stop error, the best way to deal with it is to present truth in opposition to error. Amen. That is, you don't you don't attack the people, right? You don't misrepresent what's being done. You don't bully people. It, it never heals. Now, the problem is, if, if you're the one in error, you don't have truth on your side. That's why you have to use bullying and pressure and misrepresentation, right? When you have truth on your side, you don't need to do that, right? Amen. So it, it's, it's not always the case, but generally speaking, when you have a party that is acting like the general conference was there, they're in error. We have to remember what uh, the, the word says, come let us reason together. And when we look at what the reasoning is going on here between Andreas and, and the conference, it looks like it's one-sided. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even if a person is correct theologically and he's opposing something that is error, he's in error in opposing it in this way. Right. I remember I had um, uh, quite a number of years ago, but we had uh, one of the Alberta conference um, officials at our home for Sabbath dinner. And it was a very interesting conversation. And my son, Joe, who would have been about uh, 14, maybe 15 at the time, uh, you know, he was always engaged in 
in any conversations that went on. Very intellectually curious, and and uh, so as I was having this conversation with this this leader uh, of the church, he had made a statement uh, that that Joe just could not believe. Um, he was just he was just dumbstruck because what what this leader said is that the Catholic Church was not wrong in how it tried to oppose error. It was only wrong because its doctrines were wrong. So he actually believed that the methods that the Catholic Church used to try to stifle heresy were the correct methods, right? And we've seen that that idea still exists within the church. So is that totally Ouch. before? Yeah. yeah. Oh, ouch. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a, a, an Alberta conference president at our church in Warburg for an anniversary. So they had like all of the officials there. And he talked about how the reason why the Alberta conference is so united is because we get rid of the people who cause division. And um, it's not God's way. You know, Adam and Eve sinned. He offers the gospel promise. He seeks to restore. And when we see people are that are in error, our responsibility is to try to bring them to Christ, to follow the counsel of Matthew 18, right? to go to that person, to plead with them, to spend time understanding what their situation, and that's dealing with, you know, like sins, right? But when it comes to doctrinal problems, uh, the church has, has created the problem that we see in the church over the issues of, you know, the Godhead, Trinity thing, um, peacekeeping, all kinds of things. The church has actually magnified the problem because of how they've tried to deal with what they perceive as error. It, and it, it just promotes error. And, and it's such a simple thing to see. I mean, it's such a simple principle. And as I've mentioned many times in Warburg Church, we've we've never, at least in the past, you know, went into controversy when people had come to our church with teaching error, whether they were shepherd's rod or whatever, they're always welcome. And and we would listen to what they had to say. And and some of them were eventually led away from their errors. Now, some didn't like the fact that we were nice to them because they actually wanted to have, they wanted to create controversy and have opposition and and uh, so that they could sort of justify their position. So So they weren't really very pleased that we treated them nicely. So they just went someplace where they could be treated badly so that they could feel justified in their beliefs. So it, it, to me, it's just such a simple thing. I don't, I don't really understand why. And so what I would say is that, and I've said this many times, when, when people say one thing, but the results are something else, the results are what they actually are seeking to have. So I believe that there are people that are actually seeking to cause uh, destruction. They're, they're seeking to undermine the church in some way. And, and so anyway, I, I think we're going to leave it here, this part of it for now. Uh, come back to this, um, finish this one off next Friday. It's 830 and I'm not going to go past an hour and a half. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Is this been profitable going through this, these letters to the churches for people? Yes, I think it's relevant. I think that the most important of, of all Christian experience is the honesty of, of what we say. You know, by their words, you shall be justified. By their words, you shall be con condemned. And when we look at the contract, what's going on here, even in our discussions here, we can understand. This is all recorded up until the prayer, isn't it, uh, Theodore? Y yeah. Okay, because yeah. after the prayer, I wanted to talk about the different people coming in the church, but I'll talk it after we finish yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing that I can say about this, that when it comes to, you know, sometimes people bring up this issue of, you know, the questions on doctrine. And and it's it's done in a way of self-righteousness and condemnation of others. And, and we don't bring it up in that way. This is not about that we're better than they are. You know, Amen. this is really about us understanding for ourselves what is truth. And, you know, by God's grace, hopefully that we are not going to act in this way, that we are going to be humbled uh, by the truth and not, you know, 
because this is not to be something to hammer the church with. Even within the church, our, our responsibility should be seek to redeem others who are who are deceived or who have gone astray theologically, not to uh, do to them as they do to us, right? So I think that's an important point to bring up. But let's let's close with that. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have had here this evening. Um, we're thankful for each person. We know, Lord, that there's so much we don't understand. And we have struggled in our lives uh, to understand your word. We've stumbled and fallen. We've gone through byways and... Uh, like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, you've sometimes been in the dungeon of giant despair. But we know, Lord, that you have a purpose for us and that uh, the way to the celestial city is found by following the light that has gone before. And we just pray for each person, that you can watch over them, and that you can bless us on this Sabbath day. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Be with those that we love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.